Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this morning's uh, webinar uh, on corporate resilience and recovery for SMEs, um, which uh, our Professor Andrew Conway, uh, Group CEO, will be presenting. Um, we're just waiting on various people to join, so if you can bear with us for a few more uh, minutes, and making sure that we've got everyone on it increasing as we speak. Just apologies for starting off a little bit later than planned, but um, with any luck, we can fire away. Andrew, before we start, I just sort of um, just welcome you anyway, and uh, hope, hope, hope you're well. And um, I understand uh, the weather in Melbourne is not that great at the moment. I was just on a call no. earlier, so uh, <laughs> how's it going? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. It's good to be with you and uh, with the various members dialing in. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, it's just gone 8 p.m. in Melbourne um, and uh, it's a little well, it's a little it was a warm day today, but we ha have had a lot of rain in our part of the uh, in our part of the country. But um, uh, we're, we're doing OK. The feet are dry at the moment. So. <laughs> Excellent. I think I think most part of the world is uh is having some strange weather at the moment. Uh, we, we had some, we enjoyed it over the weekend. It absolutely bucketed down at uh, the weekend. And uh, and I was just on a call with the Philippines and uh, the same there. So they're experiencing some, uh, some serious weather there. So uh, just making sure everyone is safe and well. Um, right. Andrew, I think, you know, we, we're running a little bit late here, but um, uh, I think let, let's get started. So um, I'd like to, uh, introduce Andrew Conway, our group CEO, um, who will be presenting on, as the slide says, corporate resilience and recovery for SMEs. Andrew, over to you. Thanks very much, John. And uh, I'd say uh, well, good morning to you, but also good morning to our colleagues in uh, Ghana and certainly those who are joining us from other parts of the world. I know I was doing a little bit of a crash course in, in language uh, for to do uh, welcomes in Ghana. I think Machi, I think is the right way to say Good morning. So if I have got that right, uh, good morning too. If I haven't got that right, I apologise profusely. But I, uh, it's great to be with you. As I said, as John mentioned, joining you from um, Melbourne here in Australia, and I trust everyone is well. Um, some brief housekeeping. You, many of us are now very well acquainted with Zoom. Uh, we will be using the Q and A function as well as the um, primarily the Q and A function. So please feel free to pose any questions you like in that Q&A function on Zoom. You'll find that just on the menu, Q&A, and you'll see uh, the, the Q&A function sitting there um, as well. Perhaps one of the first responses I could just check if, if people are wanting to use the chat function or the Q&A function, did I get the greeting of Mache right for those that are in Ghana? Um, again, thanks very much. Uh, my, the topic I'm going to talk to you about or with you about today is around corporate resilience and recovery for SMEs, and um, I, it's an interesting time for us to be thinking about the role, our roles in business, and our roles in management, and how we actually navigate um, our leadership functions. And I want to really talk to you about uh, briefly the IPA group to put that in context, because I'll come back to using our example as a real case study of managing resilience. Um, what have we learned in recent times in terms of? particularly the pandemic, but of course we are experiencing some significant global uncertainty uh, still. Uh, those, there are many countries around the world still uh, facing the, the, the terrible effects of COVID-19, um, in addition to other health concerns, uh, let alone the economic uncertainty that uh, we see emerge through, uh, through Europe. But where are there um, opportunities for us as a profession? And how do we really focus on our role as trusted advisors? So hopefully you'll uh, leave this session with a sense of um, uh, optimism about where the profession is going uh, and where those opportunities are for us as we try and lead through corporate resilience and provide that advice to SMEs. So if that all sounds good, um, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll get uh, started with, uh, with the presentation. So, what I'll uh, talk to you about very briefly, the IPA group itself, as John mentioned, uh, we are sort of a collection of brands and a collection of, of institutes and organisations. Uh, and 
in uh, varying forms we've been around for over 100 years and certainly the IFA has been is, is in fact the the longest uh, running institute as part of the IPA group having been established in 1916 the IPA in Australia was established in 1923 and so we're approaching our centenary year in Australia uh, next year. So we have a, a long and proud history of serving small business and SMEs and it's really interesting to see uh, just how uh, our members are now in lockstep with us as institutes and working to support SMEs around the world. We obviously have welcomed in the Association of Accounting Technicians in Australia uh, into the group and we provide the IPA Deakin University SME Research Centre. And that's a particularly important point in terms of today's topic because all of our policy work in small business has a foundation in academic research. Um, I've got a background in education, have spent time at universities as well, and I've also spent time in government. And I know that when you go and speak to government, you really need to do so with solid evidence. And so that really guides our small business policy across the group and our advocacy to government and uh, various policy makers. Our vision as an organisation is for every small business to have one of our members by their side, and that is a very sort of uh, public interest vision. The mission that we have is to improve the quality of life of small businesses and their owners, and that our destination in terms of the success of our strategy will be when we achieve 50,000 members and students and the target set by our board across the group was by 2025. And I'm very pleased to report that, that target was hit uh, last week, uh, where we actually achieved 50,005 members and students across the group. Um, so a very solid track record. Our organisational strategy, I won't spend a lot of time, there's a lot of text on this slide, but just to put it in context for you, probably the key call out on this slide is very much the um, middle section. Uh, and that is the, um, if I uh, show uh, if, if I can find the pointer on my slides, uh, you'll see the SDG section. So what we've done as an organisation is map our organisational objectives, our strategic objectives and themes to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So we can actually see that there's a higher level purpose and a link to all that we do uh, as an organisation. Critically, we're here to support and to help keep uh, account of the small business segment of the economy. Uh, we have a pretty extensive reach across the group in terms of the impact in not just Australia, but around the world of the number of uh, small businesses that are directly impacted. Our practitioners uh, have a very strong base of employment uh, across the IFAC network, the International Federation of Accountants. Our organisation is in the top 20 in terms of member size and turnover. And we have members in over 80 different countries. We've got to update that slide in terms of the total number of members and students. So as I said, we have the capacity to serve the small business sector and we feel that we do it quite well. As an organisation, our results are strong. Again, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, in excess of 3,000 new members across the group each year. Our engagement with SME is very, very strong. Our commitment to learning and lifelong learning exists heavily right across the group. Uh, strong base of students and our financial returns as an organisation are solid, which means we have the capacity to invest and grow our member services. So if we look at the issue of resilience now and resilience in the face of adversity, what I'll do is give you an example of uh, a management response to COVID-19. We'll map that out as a scenario and then provide some suggestions about the way in which we would um, go about responding to that and, and certainly the way in which we change our management approach to business going forward. Because I think fundamentally, we probably, I'm sure we'd all agree that COVID has accelerated change like we would never have predicted um, in the way business operates. I'll, I'll, I'll leave to one side the tragedy that is the health consequences. And our discussion today really does focus on the business impact. That's not to ignore the health consequence, but just to say that we're focused on SMEs and the business impact. Um, but really, the, 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 the issue of the pandemic has created this approach to change, which we've never seen before. So I heard the CEO of Microsoft the other day describe that COVID really in the space of 12 months delivered around 15 years of change. And I think the way in which we operate Today's webinar is an example of that, really, uh, that these uh, webinars and the way we engage in a digital format simply just wouldn't have existed 
perhaps pre-pandemic. I mean, they existed in a sense, but they probably haven't been as stable as they, uh, as they are now and just become pretty well commonplace. So as part of, as we go through a really encouraging engagement through Q&A and chat functions um, as well, which is great seeing people using the chat function uh, before we get into it. So, um, so thank you uh, very much for the feedback. And I think we've got some questions coming, which is great. So thanks. And also John and John Barber as well, moderating those questions. So let's, uh, so look at, look at this as a scenario. And if we think about um, the, the concept that from 2022 and beyond, the only thing that is certain is uncertainty. Um, and that mid, if we take our minds back to mid-March in 2020. So again, it's uh, if we think about it, we had offices being closed right across, in our case, across our network of offices. We shifted immediately to remote working. Our revenue streams as organisations were incredibly threatened, became incredibly uncertain. Uh, the notion of pre-committed expenditure for, in our case, running events to venues, we pre-committed those costs. Uh, you know, they were up in the air. We didn't know what was going to happen to those. Our member invoicing was due to uh, take place at the same time as the pandemic started to take hold. We were rolling out a new ICT system in terms of the operating system that the organisation uses. And across our group, we had a, a, around 100 people looking to us from a management point of view to provide some certainty. So it, it was, uh, it's only in the recent memory, but it, it was a very, very um, unusual, um, unforeseen, and a time that none of us could have ever modelled um, or prepared for. To put it uh, into context, the, the business fear in our organisation was very real. Um, now, you might have had experiences that yourselves in terms of invoicing your clients or working with businesses with similar payment cycles or, or whatever, but that red arrow, without sort of going into each of the date sequences there, that red arrow points to the peak of COVID cases, um, the daily reported cases in the first wave in Australia. And that precise day was the day that the IPA was sending invoices out, the IPA group was sending member invoices out. So it couldn't have been worse timing really for uh, a business cycle perspective, um, but it was one of those challenges we had to navigate and provide some context to. So you're the CEO, you're on a Zoom call. Um, what do you do? What's your response? Uh, we have the challenge, of course, of people looking at you for that sense of certainty. And how do you navigate? What do you do first? What's the process you're going to go through? You can't just go and take your business continuity plan off the shelf because I don't know about you, but our business continuity plan didn't include a global pandemic. Um, and I think any business continuity plans would have. So if you put yourself in that situation, you may well have been in that situation as a business manager or owner yourself what's the first thing you do? And my suggestion is, as we've learned from this process, is to relax. Because there was crisis happening all around us. And this is one of those very, very basic principles that we, you might have on an aircraft or, uh, or, or other um, uh, such vessel, where you apply the oxygen mask to yourself first. You know when you have that safety demonstration that says you can't help other people unless you have put the, the oxygen mask on yourself. And so before we, before we start thinking about the immediate term response to our businesses and people we interact with, we have to say, what position am I in to be projecting that sense of, of confidence and that we are in control? And so I think that one of the very big lessons we had to learn in the process and we have learned since is that we do need to relax, take a look at the situation objectively and manage through in a, in a constructive and structured way. Another way of describing that is to, to adopt the mode of the duck, and that is to keep calm on the surface. M meanwhile, we might well be paddling very, very furiously underneath the surface, trying to understand what's going on. And that's not really about us projecting a, a sense of being inauthentic or being fake, um, but it really is about that sense of fear and panic. Because in any organisation, fear and panic spreads very, very rapidly. And I fundamentally believe that the role and goal of any leader is to absorb the fear of the people that you lead. And that's not to take on everyone else's burden, 
But when people are looking at you, if you're on that Zoom call and you're absolutely fearful about what's going on and how uh, you're going to respond, how you're going to manage that situation with those people looking to you to give guidance, if you're able to absorb their fear and say, I acknowledge it, I understand your concern, and here is our plan. The, the ability that brings to, to, to bring down anxiety and concern is very important. It means we're in a, in a better mindset to approach the practical challenges we face rather than running around hysterically saying that the sky is falling in. So that's a really critical principle, I think, that our goal as leaders is to absorb the fear of the people we lead. So our response phase to the pandemic in particular, and that we've learnt since the process has been to firstly meet with the team uh, and to clearly outline our response and provide as much information as we knew. Uh, and that's to say that we are very much, we were very much an open book approach to the, to the, to the response. We then had uh, our group executive and, and uh, we run an executive team. We call it our group executive and uh, to assess very much the, the fundamentals of the business. So we went back effectively to basics. We're looking at cash assessments and our core business processes about member invoicing and, and, and things we would uh, otherwise just perhaps even take for granted sometimes in terms of our processing. We assessed the worst case scenario in terms of what would it mean to us if we had to make some drastic changes. Our planning horizon would normally have been over seven or, or even eight years. In fact, our, our strategic plan was set in 2018, projecting out to 2025. And what, of course, changed is that that long range strategic planning became sort of a month by month, sometimes week by week, even day by day proposition of planning. Uh, we developed a resource allocation plan. We looked at alternative staffing models in the different jurisdictions we operated in. We looked at the core products and, and services to make sure that they were still fully operational and in professional body space. Of course, it's really important for us to provide you with up-to-date technical information. So that was a critical and core service that needed to be provided because clients were coming to you expecting information uh, and they needed to know as soon as the government made a policy announcement, they expected the profession to be across it. And so we had to be just one step behind those policy announcements. The process of continually keeping staff informed. And I suppose underlining all of this is the value of real-time financial and business performance data. I would hate to think what it would have been like to try and navigate a response to a global pandemic as an organisation without access to reliable real-time data. It would have been very, very challenging. And I'm sure your businesses uh, would have felt the same, um, no doubt. We then looked at the traditional approach to decision making because that seemed sort of redundant in a way that we needed to move and move quickly. Uh, our focus then became our team and the safety and well-being of the team, uh, engaging with various stakeholders, which was really important. And then looking at risk management principles of being able to identify, assess, ameliorate or reduce and then review that risk as well. And effectively breaking those tasks down um, and that, that planning horizon down. So you know, month to month became sort of the approach rather than uh, you know, looking at a, a span of series of years. So as we sort of emerge from that immediate term response phase, we adopted this approach of people first. And that's really making sure that our people were safe and secure. Now I'll come back to this in a bit because I think this is probably the key learning out of uh, the crisis and certainly as we've come to understand what does it mean about resilience. And this is not just the domain of larger organisations. Putting people first is I think one of the significant changes and, and shifts that the pandemic has taught us uh, in a sense. Not to say we weren't doing it well in the past but it brought it into the spotlight to say that putting people at the centre of everything you do is absolutely critical. And I think our challenge as a profession is that we often get caught in the trap of assuming that our profession is get about getting the numbers right. Uh, and, and that's understandable because that's our history. But really what uh, the recent years have taught us is actually it is about quality of life. It's about people and it's about the human interface. So are our members okay was another key aspect. And I know John was doing this repeatedly. We were in Australia as well, doing welfare calls, welfare checks on members saying, are you doing okay? 
can we help you in any way? Um, you're not alone. And particularly for practitioners who might be sole practitioners, who may not be and may not have a lot of inter interaction with other people, we wanted to make sure they felt supported. Um, then looking at our cash position, looking at our strategy and resources, taking a risk adjusted forecast approach, breaking those tasks down to very, very basic elements to say, where are we at? And we, we developed what we called a COVID response team uh, and, and that met uh, weekly at times, um, a few times a week to actually assess those tasks. Look at sustainable actions we could take so we weren't just making decisions on the fly. We're looking at what could we put in place that would go the distance to provide support because we just didn't know how long uh, the uh, lockdowns and so forth would, would go on. And putting that in context, this is not a gold medal that anyone wants to win, but in Melbourne, where I'm based, uh, we had 264 days of continuous lockdown. And unfortunately, that that uh, wins the record of being the, uh, the, the toughest and longest lockdown in the world. And that meant we weren't able to leave our homes. We were, uh, well, I don't need to describe lockdown to anyone. I think we all know what lockdown means uh, post COVID. Um, but we wanted to make sure we're also capturing our learnings to, to build our resilience going forward. And then making sure we were focusing on how our people were, were coping. So again, once we went through the business checklist, right, come back to it, how are people going? And that meant coming up with some pretty outside of the box or outside of the square solutions. We, we ran afternoon trivia times on Zoom. We did um, care packages. We ran fitness classes uh, with, with uh, gym instructions. Um, doing things just to keep people together and connected uh, to make sure we were providing that sense of support. And that is that notion that people, our people are our true north. And whether that's your staff or whether it's your clients or the businesses you're working with, fundamentally people is what it's about. And I, I've described this as a new approach and it, it's probably a little unfair because I think we were always doing it, but we're not necessarily thinking about it with the focus that I think it, we now think about people. Um, and that's really critical from a leadership perspective. Th those things that were once described, you know, if you're walking down the corridor and you talk to a colleague or you'd have a, a, a recruitment process, recruiters have this um, a habit of referring to skills of communication and, and, and some leadership skills as the soft skills. So you might have heard that terminology used before, the soft skills. They're actually the very hard things to do. And I think soft skills are actually leadership skills. Um, and, and that is about understanding what it means to lead and how you provide that sense of direction. And if as leaders, we are not providing a sense of clarity to say, here is where we're going. This is what it looks like when we get there. What tends to happen in organisations, in my experience, is that people, individuals, create their own sense of direction and destination. So if there's no clarity about where you're going and how you're going to get there, individuals in the organisation create their own. And that breeds a sense of inertia and people simply become confused about what the core mission is you're on. So that's meant we've had this big shift in the way we approach uh, resilience, the way in which we approach our uh, management, the way in which we might serve our clients and, and small businesses. Before the pandemic, we pretty much had a growth mindset. It's probably fair to say, I think we're all we may have been in the same boat of thinking that things were okay and we're open to new challenges. Um, and that changed almost overnight to become a survival instinct. The long-term view was replaced with the daily assessment of how your business is performing. ICT was once seen in business as a cost and a line of expenditure and CEOs. It'd be pretty, be pretty common for CEOs to take a red pen to ICT spends to try and balance the books. What we've learned from the pandemic is, of course, that they are critical investments. And where would we have been if it wasn't for investments in ICT? Work from home was once seen as the domain of perhaps senior staff or the limited few in organisations. Well, it's of course in most jurisdictions become the norm. Um, and that's a challenge in mindset as well. Um, early days of the pandemic, I was saying, let's get people and you know, drag them back to the office. We're paying for these leases. Let's see. But people have just changed the way they work. And I think um, we've come to the realisation that that's okay. And if you're delivering the result, it is okay. And so we have to perhaps uh, change the way we think about that as uh, business managers. Um, business continuity planning was once seen as a risk 
uh, taking a risk-based approach and you'd have a, a plan there to satisfy insurers or maybe satisfy the auditor, well, that became a process of executing business continuity plans. Um, so they, were, they would once gather dust on the shelf, we actually ended up using them, of course. I've used the example here of um, Melbourne to Sydney. Now, air traffic in Australia, as you know, I don't need to tell people in, in Ghana, but we have a, a quite a, a dispersed uh, continent in Australia. So to get from Melbourne to Sydney is a tad over an hour flight, an hour and a half flight. And uh, before the pandemic, it was the third most populated air traffic route in the world. Um, and there was a flight every 15 minutes between Melbourne and Sydney. Um, post pandemic, travel budget slashed and those uh, the airlines are still struggling to uh, maintain capacity to serve those that uh, serve the, de the demand. And of course, face to face meetings were replaced with that age old expression now of you're on mute uh, that we now all come to use and use it quite frequently. So we've just changed the way we've re responded and it's driven our approach to recovery. So as we now think about taking some steps to build our resilience if we're managing and advising SMEs, I want to put put to you perhaps four actions that you could take to help build resilience. And I'll speak to these in a bit more detail in a second, but they are putting people safety first, communicating with stakeholders very clearly and consistently, reshaping strategies to maintain business continuity and building resilience and preparing for recovery. Now, what this looks like uh, on a slide, um, and I'm sorry if it's showing on your screens very small, I'll walk through each of these uh, segments for you. Now, this is, uh, I said before, this is just not the domain of the of, of big organisations. This is, I've sourced this from, from EY, but I think it's a really good way of thinking about a new approach to building resilience. So if we think about starting with people safety first, this is not just about occupational safety or safety in a production plant. This is about looking at flexible work arrangements. Have we genuinely asked and engaged with our staff uh, about what they want. Now, that's not to say you agree to everything, but to listen to staff, to listen to the team, to say, what is it that you actually want and what does flexibility mean to you? And the happy point is where those two uh, view, viewpoints intersect, where the organisational goals and your goals as a manager and the individual goals intersect, because that's the sweet spot of flexibility. And it will depend on, on each of the employees um, and, and their particular wants and needs. Looking at, um, at how do we then put the practical things in place around infection pre prevention programs, uh, looking at regular transparent communications about safety and, and, and making sure that employers are reassured and aligning with current government policies. And so that's, you know, depending on, on the jurisdiction, um, I, I think governments had to move very quickly and governments across the world we've observed made plenty of mistakes in the way they communicated. But if we spare a thought for them for, for a moment, um, I'm not always a big defender of governments and, and uh, politicians, but they were very, very challenging situations to be in. I certainly wouldn't want to have been in there making the decisions that some of them had to make. Um, so when we think about the speed with which the response had to happen, uh, we, we need to make sure that when that information is provided, we communicate it to our teams. Then the second quadrant there is looking at communicating with stakeholders. How do we keep our customers uh, apprised of, of the impacts to products or service delivery? So if there's been a challenge to supply chains, how do we communicate that? How do we do so in a very transparent way? And that's not to shift blame, but to keep our customers and stakeholders um, uh, aware of what's going on. Looking at the, uh, you know, that notion of being cautious about the uh, business as usual mindset, making sure we do stay in contact with our suppliers, as I said before, around supply chain security, uh, looking at the terms and conditions on various loans that might be in place and various contracts of supply that you might have or credit with creditors and investors. So that's again, looking at the your sort of ecosystem of business, uh, making sure that no one is being forgotten in the process, particularly when it comes to core supply lines. And then looking at making, uh, making sure that we remain compliant, of course, in terms of the advice provided to um, on, on liabilities. Then looking at reshaping strategy, the third quadrant there, uh, uh, and that's really around business continuity, critically assessing your short-term liquidity. Um, I, I think it's fundamental and, and each of these elements could become really the basis of your ongoing resilience plan. I'd be encouraging businesses to develop a resilience plan. 
Um, but looking at the financial and operational risks that you might have as an organisation and your capacity to respond, do you actually have the team to respond? Um, looking at those other supply chain options you might have to ensure you meet your obligations contractually or, or otherwise. What, is the, what does a crisis mean to your budget and business planning? And then looking at domestic and foreign government support provisions that might be in place that you could access. And then finally, looking at the resilience um, uh, plan and, and preparing for recovery of, of executing those strategies uh, to, to, and then really critically monitoring the outcome of that execution. Um, renewing your business continuity plan. Again, it's pretty stock standard, but, but it is fundamental to reset those, those settings. Making sure decisions we're taking and the actions we're, we're taking during the crisis, um, I, we're doing so with a, that sense of recovery in mind. So I mentioned before about taking decisions that are sustainable, that we can actually keep in place for some time rather than giving our staff or suppliers or our stakeholders different messages at different times and sort of zigzagging around our, our response. And then making sure we are also uh, evaluating and calibrating uh, the opportunities that uh, organize, that other countries and supply lines might provide. Now in our jurisdiction in Australia, that might be supply lines and demand that might come out of China, um, but there might be other places. See, Australia is a large exporter of iron ore to China. Um, and so making sure that, for example, in the Australian context, that those uh, opportunities are, are available. There's some sort of four very broad actions to build resilience. People first, communication, strategy, and then a resilience plan. So in terms of reimagining management, um, I really believe that with the advent of technology now and automation, in accounting, this might be a strange statement to make, it's actually hard to get the numbers wrong. <laughs> Um, because we use systems and processes so much, we're using automation so much, it's difficult to get the numbers, uh, the, the, it's hard, sorry, to get the numbers wrong, but it's very difficult to get the human impact right. And, and that's what I mean about changing our mindset from the numbers being our focus to people being our focus. And that our business goal, and in fact, our own organisational goal uh, of why we exist is to improve the quality of life of people we interact with. And I'd encourage you to, uh, to perhaps even do that in your own businesses. What is your, I was to ask you the question, what is your fundamental social purpose as a business? And that can be from a micro business to a large business and everything in between. What is your fundamental social purpose? And, you know, it takes a little bit of thinking to get there. And if you think you've got it, see if you can go another level up until you get a very macro view of why am I doing this? Now, that might be... Um, pure profit. It might be, I want to make as much money to provide the best life for my family. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Uh, or it might be if you're in the not-for-profit space, it, it might have a social lens. Or if you're in the government space, it might be to build accountability and, and transparency. Whatever the case may be, I'd encourage you to, to undertake that process of why does my business exist? What is our, our fundamental social purpose? And I think it's a really important process for us to go through as we start mapping resilience. And these are conversations uh, strongly encouraged to be having with SMEs. If we can get these conversations going with SMEs, we'll all be better off. Um, I think also the other reimagining of management we've experienced and in building our resilience through to SMEs in particular is as advisors uh, that, and as leaders, I think, it, the, the, the importance and the impact of showing vulnerability, that nobody knows everything and that it's okay to say, I'm actually having a tough time at the moment uh, and I'm, I'm struggling on this particular point or, or I'm, just, I'm just having a down time. And that's okay. I, I, you know, there was a time where in some cultures, you know, that sense of I'm just not coping very well right now was seen as a sign of weakness. I would hope that we're turning that corner to that actually being a sign of strength, where we actually say it's okay to say, I'm not okay at the moment. And so we've, we've had a very strong focus on that as an organisation. Uh, and that breeds this sense of community that we tap into. And that whether you belong to a professional body or whether you belong to your local community, whatever the case may be, making sure you have people around you you can engage with. And, and we set that as our objective as an organisation to provide that sense of connection for you, that, that sense of community to engage. Um, the other key learning, reimagining our approach to digitization, how we use digital resources has very much changed the way we manage. 
and leveraging the trust position that we have as a profession. And, and ultimately, trust is a product of knowledge. That the reason why you are trusted is because you maintain the currency of your, of your knowledge. And that's why engaging, whether it's webinars like these or, or other training, that if you let your knowledge slip, your clients and the community will realize it pretty quickly and your trust position is at stake. And that is really the bedrock that our profession, our, our profession sits on, uh, our trusted position. So they are our sort of respond, recover and reimagine pieces we've learned through the pandemic. I won't go through these in great detail. I'm very happy to share the slides with you. We looked at the COVID support, our training approach as an organisation. Our recovery was, was focused on providing mental health support to members. We provided counselling services to members. That was done uh, but also in the UK and making sure that members felt they had someone to talk to. We enhanced the knowledge base and also focus on ICT investment. When we looked at reimagine, it was very much around educational pathways and what does that mean for the future and, and how do we leverage ICT to support the work we do and then importantly also sustainability. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on sustainability a little bit later on because I've, I've got a little bit of a habit of if I, whenever I'm speaking, I will we'll never not speak about sustainability. So that's sort of the organisational group response to COVID uh, and the pandemic. And as a way of demonstrating as a scenario, uh, how we've learned to change our management approach um, through the crisis and to build our resilience. So I, I mentioned at the start, I would talk to you about an opportunity that exists in the profession. And I think we all should be incredibly optimistic about where the profession is going, the opportunities that exist within it, right now, but also the opportunities that are just around the corner. Now we think about sustainability standards, uh, the sustainability standards are evolving very, very rapidly. Um, international financial reporting standards, of course, were set, uh, the, the concept was set in place, and then the, the issuance of standards took around 15 years as a, as a period to develop. Sustainability standards have taken less than three and they will fundamentally change the way organisations report. And this is not the domain of, again, the big four or larger firms or larger business. Uh, the expectation is that all businesses will use some form of sustainability reporting. But a contrast between financial reporting standards and sustainability standards, the IFRS would look at financial value, whereas sustainability standards ask us to look at the social impact or the social value of the entity, of which financial element is just one sixth of the information reported. So we talk about our contribution to environmental capital or consumption, um, manufactured capital, human capital gets reported. So we, we shift from financial focus to social focus. Equally, IFRS would look at the past or the short term past view of the organisation. So looking in the rear view mirror, Sustainability reporting encourages us to think about the long-term view of the organisation adding value. Uh, preparers um, were the focus of international financial reporting standards, so those preparing reports. And in fact, sustainability reports now mean uh, that investors are in the spotlight. So actually investors are the ones who are, are, the, who are driving the approach to sustainability standards. So that's that notion of how does the entity add value to the community? And this presents an immense opportunity for assurance services that could be the domain of all practitioners rather than just the larger firms. So I'd strongly encourage you to think about assurance in sustainability reporting as an opportunity. And that is encouraging small businesses and SMEs to think about their own resilience and how they're contributing to their society. And the byproduct of that is perhaps an additional line of advice for you and indeed assurance services as well. So uh, we are as a group providing these services and training to support you in the process, to encourage the conversation around sustainability standards. But that's probably another topic for another day entirely. It's, what I'm just suggesting to you is that sustainability standards is an opportunity to build your own resilience. And if your, your clients, your SME clients are wanting to access capital in the future, they will be expected by banks to show how they are uh, uh, using resources responsibly. 
The final point I just wanted to draw on is this notion of, of ethics. So we think about our resilience and our leadership role and our management roles. Um, I, I think it's really important for us to uh, zero in on our trust position as professionals. And that of course is not just supported by knowledge, but also about the way in which we discharge our duties. Now there, there's some theory here, of course, in terms of Kant's views and Mill's views, but there really is no gray area um, uh, on ethics. You can't be very ethical or very unethical. You are either ethical or unethical. Um, and that's that notion that Kant tells us is that acts are either intrinsically right or wrong. And that right, according to Mill, is it essentially means the triumph of good over evil. And I think it's just a helpful reminder for us to recenter ourselves as we now sort of take our, our, our focus out to our SME clients and realize that yeah, in every engagement we have, acting ethically is fundamental to how we operate as professionals. And that is really very much the scaffolding we put around our trust position. That as trusted advisors, an ethical framework is what guides us in everything we do. And, and that if something doesn't feel right, um, we have obligations as professionals to make sure we do something about it. And they are three critical ethical questions. And I say this to students all the time, I, I talk to as part of our programs we run, um, I think helpful to have in our back pocket, three questions we might pose ourselves when we're faced with an eth ethical dilemma. What should I do? And that's an awareness that there's something going on. What will I do in this situation? And that is what intent do I have to do something about it? And finally, what did I do? What action did I take to, uh, to, to, to fix this situation? And it's that notion of never being afraid to speak up and that the standard we walk by is of course, the standard you accept. And so I think that's a, a, a very important sort of anchor point for us as a profession and our trusted advisor position. So the final thought for you is that as professionals, I don't think we should ever underestimate the role that we play, that the impact that you can have and that you have every day has a direct and profound impact of the lives of those around you. You are trusted, you're respected, and you have significant responsibilities to the public and we should never forget them. And we should at every opportunity reinforce them through knowledge, through building trust, through encouraging the building of resilience looking at opportunities that exist as professionals and to encourage the conversation around how do we make people's lives even better. So with that, um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I've got my contact details there. My email address is available. And certainly if uh, for those of you on LinkedIn, um, I'm very happy to connect via LinkedIn if you'd like to. Uh, but John, I'm, uh, I might pause there. And certainly if there are any questions or comments, yeah. Um, I, I just hope you don't tell me I was on mute for all of that. <laughs> no, you wasn't on, well, you wasn't on mute on my end, Andrew. So, um, but a big thank you. Um, a lot covered in a very short space of time. We have got time for, for questions. Um, if you've got any questions, could you please use the, um, the chat box on, on your screen there, please, the, at the bottom of the screen. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that we had a few latecomers, Andrew, so um, I'm just going to repeat... Uh, what was said right at the beginning that um, th this session has been is being recorded um, and copies of the slides will be sent out after after this uh, session so um, uh, but there, there's some general questions I think we had right at the very beginning Andrew but I, I think um, before I, I, I go on to to questions from from those on the on this call um, can I just introduce Christian Owen who is our in, uh, representative um, Group representative in Ghana, uh, Christian, uh, you're on the you're on the screen there. Would you like to say some a few words? Yes, um, thank you, John. And uh, uh, excuse my lateness. I, I got the time a little bit wrong. I think we had it set at 10 a.m. in Ghana. I think it was rather for UK 10. So there was a little bit of uh, miscommunication with the time. And, uh, um, thank you, um, Andrew. I think. It, it had been a, a lot of um, back and forth with getting the time correct. And uh, uh, we are very happy to have Andrew join us today. And uh, John, we, we are very grateful. I think all members in Ghana really appreciate the, the time uh, Andrew uh, has spent on us and um, John as well. I think it has been an insightful uh, message 
to all of us. And in this critical moment, uh, businesses are going down, prices of goods, services, transportation, fuel, everything is rising and as against salaries. And I think that um, everybody here has a role to play in, in reviving whichever industry or work environment we find ourselves in. So I think this morning, my message is a thank you to Andrew for um, exposing us to what we can do as professionals to revive the sector uh, in which we work in. And I will continue to urge all members of the IFA to continue to support the Institute and put in their best so that we can continue to help the SME and SMP sector, because that is actually the base, the grassroots of whichever corporate industry, whichever businesses we find ourselves in. And thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, so, so Andrew, the, the, the presentation has been extremely well received um, by, by all delegates on, on the, the chat line here. Um, I think someone was keen for you to just go back, if you don't mind, on, I think it was the four actions slide uh, that you presented. I don't know if that's possible to... Yeah, to have, have, uh, yeah and just, just again, very briefly, um, just, just touch on that slide, um, just to um, go through. Obviously, they're going to be receiving copies of the, of the presentation, and this is all being recorded, but um, I think they sure. just would like you just to touch just base. Sorry, sorry for no flashing. Worries. No worries. Yeah. 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 So look, look, just a, a very brief recap. I, I saw uh, Mr. Sain also has his hand up. <clears throat> Happy to come to that in a second. Um, so yeah, four actions. These are really four actions that you might consider using in your own business, even as a framework for you to navigate through with a client, to sit down and say, let's have a look at these, um, the, each of these sub points. So if, if I was to apply this in my practice, I would use this as a little bit of a conversation starter with a client to sit down and say, in these four areas, how would you rate your preparedness or your capacity to respond? So how well do you put people safety first? What are some examples there? Or would one of those dot points be an area of action for you? So I would work through it systematically uh, with a client or in my own business. And I'd say, right, how am I prepared? Now, that doesn't mean that each of these dot points is going to be exactly relevant to your business, but it might provide a pointer for you to think about how it could, you could look at the context of the client or, or certainly your own business. So I hope that does help uh, in some way, but very happy to share these slides uh, so you can have a, a more of a, a read of it. it, it might have, I know that there's, it's uh, quite small print, so I uh, appreciate it might not display very well, but very happy to share the slides. Yeah, that, thank you, Andrew, for, for that. And um, there's, a, again, some general questions. One, one is about, do we have an MOU with the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ghana? The, the answer to that one is that we are actually in, in discussion, um, early discussions, I should point out, uh, with, with that in mind. So, um, so I think it's about watching this space um, for the moment. We can't say any more than that at this present time. Um, there was another question about how do I attend IPA webinars? Well, that's very easy. Um, you can attend and register for webinars if you go onto the IPA uh, website uh, or even the IFA website, um, you'll see the number of webinars that are available. Uh, and basically you just click on and register as normal. So, uh, so there's no, no problem with that one. Um, and so, John, there was a question I noticed. There was a, one of the members had their hand up. I think it was uh, Zulfika Hussain. Um, I'm not sure if the question was resolved, but I, I thought I'd just double check. Yeah. Um, it was the hand up. To, I'll, I'll, uh, I get, the, I, I get the, the power to allow you to talk, um, which is <laughs> scary. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. I'll, I'll leave it with you in case there is a, a question. Yep. Otherwise, I'll... Um, yeah. The, the, there's a few questions coming in the Q and A bit. If if people have got any sure. questions, it might be better in the in the chat. But we're, we're we're monitoring all of these anyway, and we will get back to those ones if we don't sure. cover everything. Um, the the there was one question on the sustainability, Andrew, and, and you said you know this could be a topic, um, uh, you know, a separate topic. And I know there's a lot we can say on this front, and there's a lot that we are doing as a group in this area. Um, but mm. is, is there anything more you want to say on the, on the sustainability side of things? 
Look, yeah, it is um, evolving rapidly, John. I mean, we have two sustainability standards that have been issued by the, the International Sustainability Standards Board. I think as a group, we're really well positioned in the sense that um, we, we are fortunate that just geographically, the IWSB is headquartered in London. So we have good access to the IWSB. So we've got a, a very good ear to the ground as to what's happening. Um, you know, the, the challenges, of course, many, many economies, many governments are uh, pushing very uh, clearly and strongly towards climate action and to the COP30 uh, commitments. And certainly, um, yeah, that brings with it the issues around greenhouse gas, gas emissions reporting from scopes one to three. Um, we ran a session uh, as a group uh, a couple of weeks ago now with, with um, uh, Bob Kaplan, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, on uh, how organisations might account for environmental liability. Now, just if, if, you, if some of the members on the call might sort of be already sort of maybe struggling with getting our heads around what sustainability reporting means, my mind was sort of blown when Bob Kaplan started talking about um, environmental liability, which would mean uh, if I was to produce um, uh, this bookcase, that would be my product, um, I would attach to that product uh, the environmental liability, so the, the consumption of resource that went into it, the, the impact on the environment, the CO2 emissions, and I would price that as a liability and attach it to that product. Now, if I sold that bookcase as an entity, the bookcase would leave my premises, but with it, it would also leave with the environmental liability attached to it. So it becomes traded with the, with the product. So I was sort of think, trying to get my head around how that would happen. What does an opening balance look like in a ledger or, or what happens if the asset gets written off? Um, so there's a range of different approaches, but they are some conversations that are taking place with the US, for example, the US Securities and Exchange Commission are thinking about what do they need to do to, um, uh, to bring in this environmental liability concept. So there's a lot of issues. I mean, sustainability reporting one of the biggest challenges has been the varying framework. So you've got the global reporting initiative that was emerging, the value reporting foundation, you had integrated reporting, you had different economies doing different things and you had this patchwork of sustainability reporting approaches. The pleasing thing is the global community came together and said, we just need one set of standards. We've learned our lesson in terms of financial reporting. We need one set and that's how we've ended up with the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so, I would just be encouraging members, when you see a topic come up, if there's something in, in Ghana or in jurisdiction you're in about the conversation to do with sustainability, absolutely jump into it. So it might be a discussion group. It might be a training session. Um, we try and do as much as we possibly can in this space, but it's, it's evolving almost as we talk. Um, and so we need to try and stay ahead of the curve and develop solutions. So we are both the IFA and IPA very much looking at how we build education product, how we look at our qualifications, how we equip members with that knowledge, because it's, this is not some sort of um, topic of the day or you know, next year it'll be something else. This is not what triple bottom line was uh, a decade and a half ago. This is happening and it's happening in a very big way with a global push and we need to hold on to it. The reason why we need to hold on to it is that if we don't, other professions will. And, and so that pre presents a significant risk to us if we don't provide solutions. So my, my encouragement is just engage in the conversation. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrew. And I, I think this is a good point to mention um, about the, uh, we've got two, two quite big events in November. We've got the uh, virtual international conference which is on the 10th of november which are uh, um, by by pure pure luck is is accountancy day um which is which is good but within that that particular program um there is a, a big area on sustainability uh cyber security lots of interesting um speeches present uh, presentations sorry um that is global um it's not just purely uh, a local sort of um issue it's very much global issues and and then on top of that we've got the ipa congress which is also in november so again that's four it's a couple of days full of uh, presentations which can be uh you can actually connect to that virtually as well so on the ipa and on the ifa websites 
If you're interested in, in those events or any other webinars, then it's straightforward. Just go on and you can log on and register accordingly. So, um, um, Andrew, I don't think there's any more questions for now. Christian, is there anything more you wish to add before we, we end this session? Yes, I think um, you, had, you have already um, spoken about the international conference and uh, which is coming live online on uh, November 10th. And I will entreat all members to um, do well to register as much as possible. I think last year was very interesting. Um, and I'm hoping that this year we are going to replicate the same interest and the same by um, the IFA and the IPA continue to grow. And um, we are happy that we continue to grow and expand in Ghana. There has been, over the years, there has been a um, series of um, discussions with regards to our um, uh, affiliations or our uh, MOU discussions with the ICA. And this has been a, a one of the major issues that uh, members have continued to ask. And um, as John had already explained, we, we, we have had some discussions with them and we will continue to engage them. We, from an IFA perspective, will continue to support members and ensure that every member, wherever you are, um, we meet your basic uh, needs in the professional uh, sector in which you find yourself. We will continue to support. And if you are in Ghana and um, you want to have more information about the IFA, don't hesitate to send me an email or give me a call. Uh, my number is 024-8956-150. Or you send an email, christiano at ifa.org.uk. Um, existing members will continue to interact in our very interactive WhatsApp page. And uh, I want to assure you that we are not ignoring your messages. We will have time to address all of them one after the other. Um, John, there have been some concerns which I will give you later after this meeting, you and Jonathan. Thank you for joining and thank you, Andrew, for your time. We are very happy to have you in Ghana and uh, we are hoping to see you physically here in the years to come. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for, for working on the background and we are very happy. Right. Have a good morning. Thank you, Christian. And thank you everyone for joining and a big, big thank you, Andrew, for taking the time uh, to present to everyone this morning. Uh, wish pleasure. everyone uh, a great day and um, look forward to seeing you again very soon. Okay, goodbye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.